cubic meters, probably foam or something. Okay, and we set it on the, a scale and we find that it has a mass of three kilograms, we can simply calculate its specific volume as one cubic meter divided by three kilograms or 0.3 repeating cubic meters per kilogram. Now, there are a lot of specific properties. We will have specific enthalpy, specific internal energy. That's why that little u, remember I said I described that little u, that lowercase u? That is the energy per unit mass, whereas an uppercase u is the total energy. That's another thing you need to highlight in your book, is that little u and uppercase u, because we will use them. May as well go ahead and uh, highlight enthalpy as well, which is H, capital H and lowercase h, although h is used for other things too, especially in heat transfer, like convective heat transfer coefficients. Okay. We'll come to that in a bit. There is one more specific property that is kind of like the odd man out. I call it the joker in the pack. Okay, and that is specific gravity. Anybody ever heard of specific gravity? You've probably heard about it in fluids, right? Well, what is specific gravity? Well, specific gravity is not a per unit mass property like all the other specific properties. I prefer the term relative density because that's what it really is. So relative density is really just how dense something is versus the density of water. So if it has the same density of water, then the specific gravity or the relative density is one. Now, actually, the density of water varies. It depends on its temperature. In fact, a lot of things depend on temperature. But anyway, we have to decide what density of water we want to use. And so the standard reference state is 4 degrees Celsius, where water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, or 1.94 slugs per cubic foot. Okay. Any questions on that? So specific gravity, I wish was named differently because I'd rather specific properties always be per unit mass properties, but there we go. Yes? Do we use <coughs> slugs per foot cube or do we use uh, like pounds mass per We usually use pounds mass in this class. Anybody know how many pounds mass per cubic foot for water at uh, standard conditions? 62.4 pounds mass per cubic foot, that's right. So it's a number worth writing down somewhere. Uniform systems. I always get to this point in the class, and most of the time I teach this class in the mornings. I don't know how that works out. But usually we've all gotten up, and pancakes are looking pretty good at that point. We've had cereal in the morning. And I always say, well, you know what I ought to do is bring in my, uh, my griddle and cook you guys some pancakes. Because I love pancakes. I don't know about you guys, but I absolutely love pancakes. I used to be able to eat more of them. Now if I eat too many, I get sick. I think I'm just getting old. So anyway, um, I used to try to cook pancakes in a skillet on the stove. Anybody ever try that? Just don't. It's not worth it. It doesn't work. The center burns. The outside's not done. You try to flip it over. It doesn't work. Trust me. Get yourself one of these griddles, okay? Electric griddle. You can find them for 10 bucks at the Goodwill, okay? They heat very uniformly. And so what happens is you get a nice golden brown over the whole surface of the pancake. And I think I even posted my pancake recipe. Hang on. Because I said this so much, the student said, you know, your pancakes actually sound pretty good. If you're not going to bring in a griddle and cook some for us, would you at least give us your recipe? And I actually did. There it is. Okay. <laughs> Uniform system. <laughs> it, they, I swear, these pancakes taste exactly like the International House of Pancakes. So all you guys are going to swell up now, now that you know how to make good pancakes, right? <laughs> but uh, if you look it up, there was a book that I found in the library back when I was in college. Because um, I wanted to make some good food, and I thought, well, I like all these different restaurants. So I found this book, Copycat Recipes. And their, their recipe for International House of Pancake pancakes was awesome. It is perfect. So uh, get yourself a griddle. There's the recipe that I use. I actually varied it a little bit from the uh, recipe that's in the book, and I think it comes out a little better. So if you want it, there it is. You can look at it. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's what I'll do instead of bringing in the griddle and actually cooking for you guys. Okay? Well, why am I telling you about this? Well, what was wrong with the first effort at making pancakes? Well, I actually found out. I'm a geek cook. Okay? I like to cook knowing what's going on with the food so I can control it and make it come out tasty. So I went down to Harbor Freight and I actually bought myself an infrared thermometer, put the pan on the stove, and measured the temperature. You know what I found? The center of the pan is really hot and the outside edges are far away from it. Not far, but actually not very far from the center. It's actually fairly cold. And so the problem with the pancakes was that the center was hot and cooking the pancake, but the outside was not. So I could never get nice, uniform, golden brown pancakes. But when I got one of these griddles, actually it was a family friend that gave me theirs. It was an elderly couple that were moving into a nursing home. And they were like, well, we've got to get rid of our stuff. So who wants some of this stuff? Well, I took the griddle. I thought, well, why not? It looks like an interesting thing. They never tried to cook on that. 
I got it and tried pancakes, and man, it was amazing. The reason is because you can imagine this system as having a Cartesian coordinate on it, okay? So you've got changes in X position and changes in Y, and no matter where I pointed my thermometer, what I found was the same temperature, exactly the same. Nice, uniform. So this is a uniform system. A uniform system is a system where no matter what point you look at within the system, you find the same properties. Not just the same temperature, but the same pressure, the same energy, all these different things. Okay? So I told you all of that so that hopefully you remember uniform systems. Okay? And now you know how to make good pancakes too. So there's no change in any property with respect to a change in any position within the system. Obviously the system could be a three-dimensional system. So there'd be another coordinate you could move through. And yet, to be a uniform system, no property could change in moving along any of those coordinates. Obviously, until you got outside of the system. You understand uniform property, uniform systems now? Probably never forget that. All right, system states. Another thing we're very interested in is the state of a system. So what do I mean by a state? Well, a state is really just a collection of properties at one particular value for each property. So a state might be, well, your car right now is at a particular state, right? Your car, the engine's cold, it's not running, right? The pressure inside of it is atmospheric pressure because if any pressure was in the cylinders, it's leaked down long ago, right? If your car's been here a little while. So the, the, your car is at one state. It's going to be at a different state once you start up the engine and drive home or wherever you have to go and then shut it off. What would be different? Well, the temperature would be different, right? That would be the main difference. The oil would be, might be in a different place, right? There could be other changes. The, the density of the air inside of the cylinders will be different because it's warm. So there's all these different properties of your car, for example, that will be different. Now, for our systems, our systems are usually smaller than that. They're usually not like a, a hunk of metal with all kinds of oil and antifreeze and everything in it. Instead, our systems are usually just one fluid. So imagine the gases again above a piston. Now the cylinder's laying on its side. We had them upright, downright, now it's laying to the left, but there we go. So if we imagine a state of the system, we could plot volume and pressure on a two-dimensional graph. That would be only two of the properties. There would also be temperature. There would be a certain amount of mass, internal energy, enthalpy, and entropy. Actually, there wouldn't be any enthalpy, but you could pretend there is. So all these things, you don't know what a lot of these are. That's okay. Internal energy, enthalpy, and entropy, you probably won't know what they are when the course is over. Okay, let's just be honest. I don't know that I know what they are. No idea. I'm just kidding. You will know better what they are. Um, entropy is kind of the one that's difficult to understand, but we'll talk about that later. But for now, you know what pressure, temperature, volume, and mass are, so you can understand that the system would have a certain value of all of those properties at this one state. But if you were to move the piston and compress the gases, what would happen is the volume would obviously decrease, because look, we've got less volume than we did before, and the pressure would increase if you did this quickly enough, right, where your, the seals don't leak, or pretty close to it. And so this is something that happens during your, um, uh, your engine's running, right? The piston does get compressed, and certainly the properties within the system changes. And so the way we model those changes, we usually think of the system moving through equilibrium states. And what do we mean by that? What we mean is that the system is changing slowly enough so that the gases are always in equilibrium. What do I mean? Well, there's thermal equilibrium, mechanical equilibrium, phase chemical equilibrium. There's many different types of equilibrium, but a non-equilibrium system would be if you tried to push the piston so fast that pressure increased over here quicker than it increased over here. You understand what I'm saying? If you push this piston fast enough, the air or the gas or whatever it is won't have enough time to move over there, and the pressure on one side will actually be a little higher than the other. It won't stay that way, obviously, right? It's not at equilibrium. As soon as you stop pushing the piston, the gas inside is going to kind of slosh around. There will be a pressure wave bouncing back and forth. Eventually, the system will come back to equilibrium, right? But the idea is that the processes that our, our systems will go through to move from one state to another will be slow enough so that we will frequently assume equilibrium. So we're going to assume equilibrium states are passed through as the piston in your car's engine moves up and down performing work and pushing your car down the road. There's a little bit of a problem with that. Do you think that that's accurate? Especially when we're talking about something like chemical equilibrium. What is chemical equilibrium? Well, that's where all of the reactants and products don't change quantities, right? So if you think about a piston in your car, 
that has compressed the air and fuel charge so that now you see the air fuel charge in here. The spark plug has just ignited the air fuel mixture. It does burn quickly, but it doesn't burn instantly. If it burns instantly, that's called engine knock. You're not going to have pistons for very long and your engine won't run for very long. Okay? So what actually happens is the spark plug lights up the fuel air mixture and the pressure near the spark plug increases rapidly and a pressure wave actually propagates across the cylinder. Okay. Now let's think for a moment. Over here we've got burned fuel in air. Over here we've got unburned fuel in air. Are those in equilibrium? Heck no. So we do not have chemical equilibrium in the real system, right? However, we're going to assume that we have something close to chemical equilibrium. Turns out the chemical equilibrium won't matter too much to us. What really does matter to us is thermal equilibrium. Well, where is it hotter? Here or here? At the spark plug? Right at the spark plug, definitely, right? That's where the burning is occurring. Of course, it's going to be over here pretty quick, but right now, there's a much lower temperature over here than there is over here. There is not thermal equilibrium. And yet, we are going to assume that there is always thermal equilibrium. Okay? Now, it's okay. You got to crawl before you can walk, and you got to walk before you can run, right? So we're trying. We're going to learn some important things about engines, even though our models will not be 100% perfect. Okay? We can learn some very important things, even with these very gross approximations. Phase equilibrium has to do with the idea that the any liquid or vapor is in equilibrium with each other. Not not. It's not as if uh, liquid is boiling off into the vapor phase or vapor is condensing into the liquid phase. They're balanced. Okay. <coughs> So, no, equilibrium states are not a real, real good model for what we're going to study, but they will suffice as an introduction. So what we will assume as a system moves from one state to a second state is that it moves along a process path that we will call quasi-equilibrium. In other words, if you stopped at any point along the process path, you would find that the system is in equilibrium with itself. There's not a higher concentration. It would be a uniform system. Does that make sense? And not changing. Okay. Questions, comments so far? All right. There are simpler processes. There are processes where there are certain assumptions we can make that will simplify things a bit. There are isentropic, isothermal, isobaric, and isochort, or also called isometric processes. Let's see if we can play a matching game here. This is getting kind of boring because I'm the only one talking. <laughs> uh, what do you guys think? Which one goes with which? I think baric goes with pressure. I think so too. Uh, so isobaric goes with pressure. The giveaway is that bar is a unit of pressure. Good. Isothermal goes with temperature? Yep. Isothermal means constant temperature. Good. Isochord slash isometric goes with constant volume. That's right. And so that leaves us with isentropic being constant entropy. We don't know what that is yet, but that's okay. Entropic entropy is in the word. So yes, that's the way they match up. Good job. So there are all these different types of processes that are actually special types of processes where we can make some assumptions and know more about the process between the two states. Okay. There are steady flow processes. What is a steady flow process? Well, a steady flow process is a process where no matter where you look in the system at any point in time, you will always find the same thing. So, for example, this is the system is called a continuous stirred tank reactor. It's probably something you've not seen before. But it's something from chemical engineering that we dealt, dealt a lot with uh, in my studies. And the idea here is that you put in a feed of reactants you stir it and heat it or cool it, whatever is needed. In this case, I've written cooling jacket, but it could be heating just as well. And you draw products typically off the bottom of this thing. Sometimes you draw a product off the top if it's a gaseous product, but that's not real common. Anyway, so the, um, the idea here is if I look at this point in the feed line, sure, I might see different, different uh, you know, the same chemicals, but a different say this. You have the same chemical, but it's not the same, mo different molecule. There we go. The molecule is back here. If I look at it here, it doesn't matter when I look at it, I will find the exact same pressure, temperature, and other properties. Same thing with the product. Now, the, the feed of the product may be very different, and what's in the tank may be very different from the feed of the product, but 
If I look at any property at any point in time, there's no change. There's no difference in that property. It doesn't matter if I look at it a day, a minute later, an hour later, a month, a week, whatever. It doesn't matter. So finally, we get to talk about cycles. What are cycles? We're going to study cycles in a lot of detail, but we'll do that later on in the course. We have to go through this introductory material first, get through heat transfer, and then we'll go through cycles. I'm going to try to pull hard, and I apologize if it's too fast, but I always get to the end of the semester and just don't have enough time to cover cycles like I'd like to. So I'm going to try to pull harder this semester so I can give you more. If we don't get to, to cover cycles very well, then 320 will give you a really good dose of cycle type um, um, study. But anyway, I really like these uh, animations. This is a standard four-stroke engine, so it's an auto cycle. And you've got uh, what? Well, there's intake, compression, power, and exhaust strokes. See all those? Okay, so the, the cold air with fuel comes in, gets compressed, ignited, pushes the piston down, and then the exhaust comes out. Okay. Now that can be represented by a cycle uh, diagram, and this particular cycle diagram is a pressure versus volume diagram for the gases above the piston. But the idea behind a cycle is that it is a series of processes that bring the system back to where it started by virtue of the way it moves. That's why it's called a cycle. Okay? Anybody know what this cycle is? Wankel. That's a Wankel engine. That's exactly what it is. It's a rotary engine. Okay, so it's actually the exact same cycle. I know that seems strange, but thermodynamically, we can't tell the difference between these two. Obviously, mechanically, you can. But what's interesting, you're actually seeing the system itself here. So let's wait just a second. The ports are uncovered by the rotor. A fresh charge of air and fuel is brought in. It is compressed, so there's intake compression. Here's power, where the uh, spark plugs, plugs light it up, and it's allowed to expand, pushing the rotor around, and then exhaust, where that is, is pushed out. Why are rotary engines so powerful, or so much power per unit volume? Because they have twice the number of power strokes. They have a greater compression mm -hmm. ratio. Right. I don't know about the, I actually don't know about the compression ratio. I'm not sure. Does anybody know the compression ratios for Michael? I don't, I thought they were a little lower. I thought they were about 8 to 1. I thought you had to run high octane gas in them. But I don't know. What's interesting about this, one uh, lobe, or one pyramidal shaped uh, rotor, has three sides to it. So it's like three pistons in one. And so that's why they're more uh, powerful per unit volume. It's because they're, they're just compact. Uh, in fact, in general, any expansion compression device can be used to make a power cycle. Uh, if you haven't seen a Wankel engine in real life, we've got one down in the lab. Uh, you can go and play with it and turn it and look at it and see how it works. It's pretty neat. It's worth checking out. Um, I usually like to have my class in that room so I can pull it out at this point and show it to you, but I can't. It's fairly heavy, so I can't exactly just wheel it down here. But I think it's down in the room, not the corner room, but the one next to the corner room. So check it out. It's pretty neat. All right. We need to define simple compressible systems. What is a simple compressible system? Well. Think with me for a moment. Let's, let's still think about your, the engine under the hood of your car. And let's think about the gases that are above the piston in your car. Okay? Now, as you're going around a corner, do you think the gases above the piston in your car are kind of being slung outward just like you are? Sure. Right? Momentum makes a difference there, right? You've got to somehow accelerate that fluid. Do you think that that effect is significant by comparison to the piston that is running up and down in the cylinder as quickly as possible, pushing that air around like crazy? <laughs> Obviously not, right? Do you think that gravity pulls down on that air that's in your cylinder? Of course. Does that make it a little more dense at the bottom versus the top? Yes. Is it important? Heck no, right? Because there's so many other much larger effects. So most of the time we will neglect the effects of gravitation and of motion on our systems because they will be small by comparison to other forces and other actions acting on the system. So the gas, we're going to neglect gravitation, we're going to neglect motion. In fact, we're going to neglect any magnetic effects, any surface tension effects, and any electric field effects that might actually have some small influence on our systems, but they're just not worth talking about. All right, finally, the state postulate. 
The state postulate is this. The state of a simple compressible system is completely specified by two independent intensive properties. What does that mean? Well, a moment ago, I showed you a system and I said, you know what, we got pressure, we got temperature, we got volume, we've got things like density or specific volume, uh, we've got uh, internal energy, we've got enthalpy, we've got entropy, there's all these properties of systems that we will care about quite a lot, that will be useful to us. Well, okay, but are they all independent? The answer to that is no. You tell me the pressure and the temperature, and I will tell you everything else about that simple compressible system. I can tell you the internal energy, I can tell you the entropy, I can tell you the enthalpy, I can tell you anything about that system. All you have to do is give me two properties. Give me specific volume, give me internal energy, I'll tell you the pressure and temperature. Okay? Because they depend on one another. In a simple compressible system, what is a simple compressible system? Well, think of a gas, nitrogen, air, okay? burned exhaust gases. These are all simple compressible systems where all we need are two properties and the rest of the properties depend. So they're all codependent. Okay. When pigs fly, I don't know about you guys, Brad Paisley's probably fairly old to you guys now. I'm not a huge country music fan, but I love comedy. I love that Brad Paisley had, he's the guy that, if you don't know, he's the one that said, uh, how did the song go? He's talking about how his significant other told him if he went fishing again that day that she'd be gone by noon, and he said, well, I'm going to miss her, and that was the chorus of the song, because he's going fishing anyway. Uh, anyway, he, he added one uh, song that talked about pigs flying, so I had to include this on it. And uh, what's, what I found interesting about this, even though it's a work of art, <laughs> made out of an old propane tank, I thought, you know, actually, we could talk about how this system potentially has all these forms of energy in it. Now, let's see if you can identify them. Uh, Thermo, this is a pig made out of a propane tank on a wire, just a wire rope that's moving around. I tried to add my cartoon motion lines there for you so you could see what's going on. Okay. Do you think there's any thermal energy in this system? Sure. As long as it's above a temperature of absolute zero, there would definitely be some thermal energy. Even though this is mainly solids, the solids on the molecular level are vibrating. They don't move so much, right, because you have to break bonds to move, but they do vibrate. Now, it is true that things can diffuse through solids. That's true, too, and there, there is motion. But in our case, we can certainly talk about thermal energy as being one form of energy that this system possesses. How about potential energy? Sure. I've tried to show it on a, a you know, a, what would you call it, lanyard or whatever, swinging around. So if it's not at the bottom of it, then, yeah, there's, there's some potential energy. Kinetic energy, well, it's moving. So yes, there's one half mv squared, as well as probably some rotational energy. Any mechanical energy, what is mechanical energy? Well, do you see these springs on the legs? As they move around, those springs are going to vibrate a little bit, and so they're compressed a bit or expanded a bit. So there is some mechanical energy. I know this is a whimsical example. I'm just trying to show you. Okay. Electric, well, i got to make, this is a stretch. Imagine two magnets on either side of this conductor. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> then there could be some electrical energy being generated as the thing moves around. Magnetic, uh, certainly possible. I don't know, maybe have had a magnet in the system or something. Chemical energy, well, if somebody forgot to remove the propane when they welded the tank, it'd be really stupid. But there could be some chemical energy in this system. Even if we painted the outside surfaces, that paint can burn, and that represents chemical energy. Maybe a little practical. Nuclear? We could probably figure it out. What's that? The sun. The sun? Well, uh, if the, actually, probably some of the material that the tank is made of is actually radioactive. There's probably a very small amount of radioactive something or other. I have no idea why. Or maybe somebody forgot and left some Chernobyl leftovers in there. Who knows? <laughs> so all these energies together would be the total system energy, and we'll give it the symbol E. You know which ones we really care about? Those. Thermal energy is the most important. Potential energy is important, and so is kinetic, and so is mechanical. Those are the ones we'll deal with that are practical. These others, yeah, they, they might be in there, and that would contribute to the total system energy, but we're going to neglect those for most of the problem. What is pressure? Is pressure what you feel before an exam? Or is it stress? <laughs> well, they have the same units, same, but they're different dimensions. Uh, anyway, no, pressure is not. That's not the kind of pressure I'm talking about, at least. I'm talking about pressure that can be measured by a gauge. I had an interesting experiment with pressure the other day. I walked outside and found there was no pressure in one of my tires. In other words, I had a flat. <laughs> and at first, since I've done so much construction work on my house, I, 
at one point was just pulling out nails and things and throwing them on the ground because I was on the roof and my brother-in-law came by and he said, you know, you're never going to be able to drive across this yard without getting a flat. Actually, I've done a really good job of using a magnet afterward and anytime I see a nail, I pick it up religiously. So the screw that I pulled out of my tire, I know is not one from my house. The reason I know is because it had a square drive and I haven't used any with square drives. So I know it wasn't mine, so I picked it up from the road somewhere. You're welcome, you didn't have that flat. Uh, I did. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, of course, in Microsoft PowerPoint and stuff, where PowerPoint doesn't like all the animations that I put in my slides, but we'll fix that. So I had no pressure in my tire. Now, what kind of, um, what kind of fluid does the tire hold? Well, ideally, air, right? And you can measure the pressure of the air in that tire. And I, of course, being a good mechanical engineer, carry tools. I happen to be here, so it wasn't really a big deal. It was more of an inconvenience to fix this tire. I even carry a, a patch kit uh, where I've got the, you know, the little handle and the, the gooey ropes that you shove into the hole and pull back out. So I'm, I'm set. That's not a problem. But if I got out my pressure gauge, which I keep in my car religiously, and I measure my tire pressure, what kind of pressure am I measuring? Gauge, gauge, pressure. gauge pressure. Gauge pressure. It's PSI G, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what you're meant. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that.